Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I want to start by acknowledging that I live and work on the unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil Tooth Coast Salish people. I'm so excited to have Alex here with us today. Um, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about Alex. She is currently completing her PhD in kinesiology and health science at York University, uh, focusing on the work and professionalization of university sport coaches with a keen focus on the gendered and gendering aspects of sports coaching. In addition to being a full-time graduate student, Alex is an assistant coach at the University of Toronto working with the Varsity Blues women's volleyball team. She has dedicated her coaching and academic career to her mission statement, which is to use courage, compassion, and connection in order to build a sport community that empowers everyone to become the best version of themselves. Alex, thank you so much for being here today. Hi, everyone. So quickly before I get going, I just want to call your attention to the Starfish Project, which is the non-for-profit cause that I'm supporting. I also want to echo my support for the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society and for the Black Cat Canadian Coaches Association that Tasia mentioned in her presentation on Tuesday. These are wonderful organizations to be a part of. The Starfish Project is a project that I have come to support through myself receiving gifts, but also giving gifts to friends. Um, they're beautiful pieces of jewelry that the funds go to supporting women who are coming out of the sex trafficking industry. So it's a really important industry to support. And with that, I will share my screen and get going on my presentation. All right, so as Amy shared, my name is Alex Cron. I go by the pronouns she, her and hers. And in acknowledging the land, I seek to expose the history of colonization and racism that exists within Canada and continues to exist today, most formally in the way our lives are structured to advantage white people and disadvantage folks of color, included but not limited to those who identify as Black and First Nations. Today, I am speaking to you from Toronto, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, and Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations. I am of German and Russian Mennonite descent, and I was born on the traditional and unceded territories of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, Dakota, Denny people, and the Métis First Nation, known today as Winnipeg. I would like to invite everyone to take a moment of silence to think about the land that you occupy right now and how that land has served you. Thank you. So to begin, I want to express my deep gratitude for all of the women who have been presenting and who will present tomorrow. Thank you so much for doing your work and for sharing that work as a part of this event. You are all so inspiring to me. I would like to thank Amy for the hard work and passion that she has put into organizing this event. I so love the fact that you use the inspiration of not hearing enough women voices to then organize this event. It is wonderful to be a part of an event that acknowledges a bunch of women from different backgrounds with different experiences. Thank you for being a game changer. We need people like you to help us lead change. Thank you to Shay Lee, who I know has been doing a lot of work behind the scenes. And thank you to everybody who is tuning in and who has tuned in throughout the week. Your support is critical. So today I get to do one of my favorite things, and that is to discuss the academic work that I am doing in participation of the Women in Sport Movement in Canada. So before I get into the academics, I want to highlight what my key takeaway messages are from today. And those are that women remain on the margins of high performance sport coaching and leadership, that the solution to this critical situation is multifaceted and dynamic, that without policy and legislation backing solutions to change, initiatives like mentorship remain a woman's issue, 
And that policy on its own will not solve the issue of underrepresentation, but it does serve to hold the broader structure of sport accountable for the issue of too few women in sport leadership. I also will be explicit in saying that I am planning to make your head hurt a little bit today. And I know we have a lot of negative associations with headaches and for all for good reasons, but I'm hoping that this can be a new experience of a headache for you, a good headache, the kind of headache that leaves you thinking a little bit more about your taken for granted assumptions about sport, sport coaching and gender. And like this beautiful multicolored brain that I've put up on the slide on the screen here, I'm going to take you along a journey that looks at a thinking critical exercise that I engaged in. So I'm going to talk about myself a little bit. I'm going to talk about the problem or the problems. So myself being the who, the problems being the what, looking at the context, so that being the why, and then the current literature that looks to support women coaches. So that might also include the how. And then I'm going to take you over to the other side of my brain, or your brain in this case, and look at the research question that was guiding this research, the methods and theory, the data analysis, and eventually the results and discussion. A couple of other things to note here is that I'm going to share some never seen before data from my dissertation that I'm currently working on right now. And in specifically, this stuff will be on the gendered aspects of uh, university sport coaching. And I also will say that in most academic presentations, I'm told not to go on tangents, even though I love going on tangents. But because today is a women in sport coaching event that also blends my experiences as a coach in there, I'm going to go on a few tangents. So hopefully you don't lose you in those tangents and you come along with me. First and foremost, it's really important for me to situate myself. So I am a coach who is a feminist sociocultural researcher seeking to add relational analyses of sport and sport coaching to the broader literature on sport in Canada. I adopt a view of the world that believes people's realities are existed within, exist within their daily lived experiences and that these daily lived experiences are shaped by the broader social world that they exist within. I use the theory of feminist political economy to underpin and ground my work, and I own my social location as a white, cisgender, heterosexual, able-bodied, middle-class woman who has a lot of privilege. I know that my stories might not speak directly into the lives of some of the folks who are tuning in for this conversation, but I'm hopeful that we can find points of connection and that we can use that connection to collaboratively combat against systems of oppression that are working in our world. Before I became a coach, I was a student athlete. And as I transitioned from being a student athlete to a student researcher, I began to realize that the private issues and struggles I was having were in fact connected to larger public issues. Within the sociocultural domain, we refer to this phenomenon as the sociological imagination. So again, that's the idea that our private issues are connected to larger public concerns. An easier way to think about this is like a connect the dot puzzle. So as I go through my life and I connect the dots in my own puzzle, I recognize that these dots start to take on a form and that these forms are connected to larger forms outside of me. It is said that when we begin to recognize how our private struggles are linked to public concerns, that we are awakening our sociological imagination. In my case, that has resulted in a lot of irritation and intrigue. And for me, I experienced that primarily through curiosity. So I'm always asking questions. And some of the questions that have fueled my research over the past several years have included what is a healthy coach-athlete relationship? How does power operate within the coach-athlete relationship? How do we create psychologically safe spaces for athletes? Why do coaches do what they do? How does power operate in their context? What is the work of a sport coach? And how is that sport coaching work gendered? So in with that, I want to now share this slide, which I'm sure you're thinking, 
what does eggs and bacon have to do with anything I just shared? Well, the spark or the inspiration for this paper came from an experience that happened over a plate of breakfast, not too dissimilar from the one shown on this slide. Specifically, on August 21st of 2016, I went for breakfast with Christine Drakage. If you don't know who Christine Drakage is, here she is on the front cover of the Mentorship Guide for Advancing Women in Coaching. And while I don't have time in my presentation to go through all of her qualifications, credentials, and accomplishments, Christine is a key figure in the women in sport movement in Canada. Her impact reaches beyond the gym walls and is far reaching across the sport of volleyball in Canada. Okay, so anyway, back to my breakfast with Christine on that hot August morning. I want to say that even though I coach with Christine now, I wasn't coaching with her at the time, but I was so excited to sit down with a volleyball legend. I was so excited to chat with her about what it was like to live in Toronto, what it was like to coach in the OUA versus Can West, where I had come from, what it was like to, you know, her, what her beginnings were like as a, a female coach, and just any of that sort of gendered stuff that her and I really connect over. So I was hopeful she would have all these answers. And of course, she had wonderful answers. We had a fantastic conversation. And during that conversation, when I was being very dismissive of myself and very self-deprecating, Christine invited me to stop dismissing myself and to start claiming my space, my authority, and my experience in university sport coaching. At the time, it hit me hard in the face like, wow, like this is what support feels like. And later when I went home and reflected on it, I realized this is what mentorship is. And it was this experience with Christine, along with the guidance of my amazing supervisor, Dr. Parissa Safai, that ultimately led to me being published for this paper. So now that I've situated myself and I've given you a little bit more background knowledge on me and the spark for this paper, I wanna talk about the problems or the problem as I've listed it here. So in doing that, I'm going to do what we commonly do in the literature, which is we throw the numbers at you. And we do this because we want to drag you in. We want to draw you in. I want to say that the statistics you see on the slide here are for university head coaching positions and assistant coaching positions, and that these statistics don't include the number of women who are head coaching male programs. So these are of female programs. And as you can see here, this is depicting a pretty problematic picture of women in sport coaching. When we plot these numbers out over time, we see an even more troubling trend. And we can see, again, that we've gone from having over 50% representation in the 1990s to today, where we have 16% of women occupying university head coaching positions. There is a similar trend being shown in the Olympic coaching positions as well, and these women occupy 6% of head coaching positions, and, and the most recent data was from 2018. So although I'm showing you the numbers because they are important and they're a great way to frame the issue, I want to take us beyond the numbers. I want us to seriously consider the deeply embedded political, economic, and social practices and discourses that underpin this. When we just solely focus on the numbers, we erase important contextual information. We do not listen to the stories of women in sport coaching who are going through the day-to-day -day life experiences, and those include both good and bad aspects. And when we don't consider that important contextual information, we aren't challenging the system, and we're maintaining the status quo, which as indicated in the trends and, and this arrow here for women in sport coaching is headed in a downward direction. All right, so now that we know what the problem is, let's talk a little bit more about the context. I'm going to do my best here to slow it down at points because I'm going to throw a lot of large words at you. So I'll do my best, bear with me. When I say the deeper political, economic, social discourses and practices, I mean the written and spoken forms of communication, the ideas and ideals, 
the physical actions and behaviors, all of which are underpinned by systems of value and morality that shape our collective and individual experiences as Canadian citizens. Okay. So here we go. To make it a little bit more clear, within Canada, that means that we need to e examine our economic system, which is known as capitalism, that functions in conjunction with the governance of neoliberalism in order to perpetuate and create dominant social or cultural practices. And I've, using culture, I've used cultural hegemony here to highlight that and the work of Antonio Gramsci. So when we do not take time to examine our political, social, and economic context, we really overlook the ways in which our lives have been structured for us and how that shapes what we do, what we say, what we value, what we believe, and how we speak. Put it another way, I want to talk a little bit more about how Shay Lee really did a phenomenal job of referencing norms in our society. So what these dominant cultural practices do is they create norms, normal ways of being. And if you don't subscribe to those norms, you are typically viewed as different or othered. And othering is, there's a whole body of knowledge on othering that unfortunately I don't have time to go into here. But when this happens, it's problematic. And when Shay Lee said that we are a little bit sexist, a little bit ableist, and a little bit racist, she was referring to that broader structure that we exist within that really impacts our experience. All right, so let's put this into the context of sport. What does all of this have to do with the context of sport? Well, in sport, there is this notion that it is a liberal democratic endeavor, which means that it's available to anyone and everyone. I'm absolutely a person who advocates for sport because I have seen the power of what sport can do. But we need to realize that it is not open to everybody, that we do not all have the same experiences. If you've been tuning in to any of those conversations this week, you have heard a range of experiences from the coaches, from the athletes on the panel, from the health practitioner panel, you can see that we all come from different backgrounds and you've heard that we all come from different backgrounds and have different experiences. So it's really problematic when we say that we all have the same opportunity because if we take a close look, we don't. And oftentimes it is our social location, which is made up of things like our socioeconomic status, our gender, our race, our religion, that is part of the reason why we don't have the same experiences. This also ties into what Shaylee was talking about when she was talking about gender norms. So she shared with us her exercise of going online and looking at men versus women. Well, I'm going to do the same thing here within the context of sport, and I'm going to use myself. I am a representation of hegemonic femininity, especially within the sport of volleyball. So what do I mean by hegemonic femininity? I mean that I'm a white person who is cisgendered, heterosexual, plays the sport of volleyball, which is constructed as a white sport. I'm able-bodied, I'm middle-class, and I'm educated. And I'm offering this to say that within my sport, I have a lot of power, and that I don't experience the same things that other women experience. This also exists for men, and it's known as hegemonic masculinity. And both hegemonic masculinity and femininity really find their intersection in patriarchy. So patriarchy is a system that operates under on the belief that men are dominant over women. We can see this in all aspects of life. We can see this in the corporate sector or the business world where women are not represented as CEOs and COOs in the same ways that men's are, but where women are not paid the same as men are. We can see it in professions like engineering, where we believe that, you know, men are better at math. So, you know, they, they generally speaking, they become engineers. We can see also how this operates in everyday life. More women than men currently stay at home and take care of kids in the home. It doesn't mean that men don't, it just means that right now, that's the norm. That women's work in the home, because it's not paid work, is less valuable. And therefore that men go out and make the money and that's more valuable. 
Within sport, patriarchy is even more exacerbated. We're constantly talking about our gender. We're constantly hearing narratives like, women can't do that because they're not that strong. They're fragile. They're weak. Women can't compete against men because men couldn't really compete then. Or in the case of, <clears throat> excuse me, Castor Semenya, when she ran her, long di her short distance run, we went, well, there's no way she can be a woman because women don't run that fast. I would like to highlight that patriarchy is both oppressive to men and women because it constructs dominant gender norms, dominant sexualities, and it says that if you don't fit within those norms, you're different and therefore not as good. And as the slide suggests, we all have a part to play in patriarchy. I want to take this time to acknowledge the feminist sociocultural literature that exists on patriarchy and sport. And you can see from some of the titles here that also some of these works have looked at capitalism and patriarchy as the dual systems approach that works to oppress women. Although I am so grateful to these scholars for their work and their continued work, I do want to call attention to something that Tasia talked about on Tuesday, and that is intersectionality. We need more intersectional studies on women in sport and women in sport coaching. Intersectionality gets at the work of Audre Lorde, Perku Markula, uh, Patricia Hill Collins, Kimberly Grenshaw, women who were looking at how race, ethnicity, gender, language, a woman's social identifiers intersect with power to shape our daily lived experiences. So in the case of Tasia, she talked about how at different times her gender, race, and age were brought up as ways to discriminate against her, and sometimes all three of them were. So what Tasia is getting at really echoes what Lord says when she says there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. So again, I want to call attention to our need for more intersectional analyses of women in sport. So now that I've taken you through the context, the why, and given you a little bit more background information, I want to talk about the specific literature in Canada that seeks to support women in sport coaching. So when we look at that literature, the golden standard for support for women in sport coaching is mentorship. And mentorship is further divided into two categories, formal mentorship and informal mentorship. Formal mentorship is marked by program design. So typically, when you sign up for a mentorship program, you're put into a program. This program has very specific procedural steps as outlined in the program design. And there's typically a very well-developed professional development plan that you as a mentor and the mentee coach have to work on together. There's also things like guided processes, which include mentor training. A quick note here about mentor training. So right now, the U Sports Women in Sport Coaching Mentorship Program is running its course and hopefully coming into effect this year, although it will be interesting because of COVID. And as of right now, all of those mentor coaches have gone through mentor training. There's other programs that exist under the CAC, and those include the Women in Sport Coaching Apprenticeship uh, Program and the Aboriginal Coach Apprenticeship Program. So... I, the reason I'm commenting on those is because I've recently been named the head coach of the 2021 Canada Summer Games team for Team Manitoba Women's Volleyball Team. And I have the opportunity to work with both a female apprenticeship coach and a Aboriginal apprenticeship coach. And I have not been contacted by the governing authorities about any mentor training. Maybe it will happen at some point, but as of right now, it hasn't been stated clearly. So that sort of speaks to a little bit of the haphazard nature with which sometimes these programs run. Informal mentorship includes the assistant coach position where the head coach invariably becomes a mentor. Any self-directed learning that a coach takes on for themselves, which might include reaching out for an informal catch-up or in my case a plate of breakfast. And I want to talk a little bit about the debate that's going on right now about, well, is formal mentorship better or is informal mentorship better? I think we need to draw our attention away from comparing the two and say that both are important to the growth, development, and continued participation of women in sport coaching. 
So allow me to clarify here. If I've made you think that I don't think mentorship is important, that is not my intention. Mentorship is absolutely important. And yet at the same time, there are still a lot of questions that remain about mentorship and particularly what is effective mentorship. This first question is really important to consider. So while we can read things in a manual, how do we actually then go out and create a meaningful relationship with a person? What are the experiences of mentor and mentee coaches? And I know some of the evaluation of these programs is underway and I'm looking forward to hearing about that. And then what are the markers of success for mentorship programs? How are we measuring these markers of success? What are we hoping for? This last point I'm going to return to when I talk a little bit about my research because there's an important consideration to make here. So next to mentorship, sponsorship has also been put forward in the literature as a way to support women in sport coaches. And specifically in their article in 2016, Kern Banwell used the work of Fortune 500 companies to talk about how sponsorship is important. And they define it as a coach with financial support that has a position of power or influence that can actually advance the sponsored coach and that they typically do this through a lot of informal and formal networking. So while I can tell you from my own lived experience that sponsorship is important, this article is the first of its kind and we're still really struggling or looking at what does sponsorship look like in a competitive sport coaching environment. There simply hasn't been enough known about it. Again, I want to state that both sponsorship and mentorship are part of the solution. When I said that it was complex and dynamic, these are parts of it. I also want to highlight that when we focus on mentorship and sponsorship, we are focusing on very agent heavy approaches. So again, allow me to clarify here. In sociocultural literature, we talk about the agent and the structure. We talk about agents as people living within the larger structure, which are again those political, economic, and social discourses and practices that we operate within. So these programs right now are still dependent on female coaches to go out and do the work or a female coach to say, hey, you should be a part of this program and sign up for it. And the reason I've mentioned Cheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In Here, is because Cheryl talks about how this exists outside of sport. She talks about it in the corporate world of business. And throughout her book, she positions her success as either luck or that she went out and found people to sponsor her. So while I don't want to depreciate Cheryl's hard work in going and asking for sponsorship, again, I want to point out that she was put in a situation where she had to go do that. And again, that's only looking at one side of the problem. We're not looking at the larger structural problems. The final area of literature that suggests that, um, that, sorry, advances support for women in sport coaching is policy. So there are policies out there that do acknowledge the state of women and girls in sport. So these are like your actively engaged policy and the equity and access policies, which I'll be getting to in a bit. Policy is extremely important because it typically informs programming and it serves as a way to hold sport organizations accountable. Within sport in Canada, policy operates at all these different levels. And I know this is a relatively simple schematic of sport in Canada, so please forgive me. Um, but this is just a rough snapshot of the, what sport in Canada looks like. So I want to draw your attention to the fact that national sport organizations typically put policies in place and then provincial sport organizations or sport specific provincial sport organizations then usually it's a bit of a um, top down approach to policy. However, I will say that in some cases there are provincial sport organizations that actually lead the way and then national sport organizations use those as well. So that does happen as well, but typically it goes the other way. So again, while there is a robust body of knowledge that unpacks how important policy is and how policy really structures and shows how the institution of sport operates to include and exclude people, it's not really the focus of what I'm going to get into today. 
So I've taken you through the critical thinking sort of side of the brain, and now we're gonna head into the research side of the brain. So I'm gonna get back into unpacking this work that I put together. I wanna say that obviously, as noted in the title, I focused on the policy aspect. So I do talk about mentorship and sponsorship, but I chose to examine policies specifically within Canada. The research question that was guiding this work was how do current national level Canadian sport policies inform and impact mentorship and or sponsorship of women coaches. As I shared at the beginning, the theoretical framework that I use is feminist political economy. And very simply put, FPE looks at how the state, the market, and the home intersect to then impact the working realities of citizens. So these include both men and women. Well, I'm not going to take a lot of time here to go into the deep analysis and the world that feminist political economy is. If anybody has questions about it, I'm more than happy to answer them at the end of this presentation. Stemming from a theory of feminist political economy, I adopted directed content analysis as my methodology, which is the controlled analysis of text within the context of communication. So I did use a five stage approach, but I am for the purposes of this presentation going to pull out the areas that are most important. And I'm actually going to start with defining the coding categories. So the reason I chose directed content analysis is because I wanted to use the extant literature on supporting women in sport coaching to guide my process. So I went in and I found formal mentorship, informal mentorship and sponsorship. I pulled those codes out and then I applied them to the analysis of federal and national level sport policies. Those sport policies include actively engaged a policy on sport for women and girls, the Canadian sport policy, and the CAC and Sport Information Resource Center equity and access policies. A quick note here about policies is that both university sports, so U sports, and the Canadian Olympic Coaching Committee, the COC, do not outline equity policies on their website. And this is problematic insofar as these are both federally funded multi-sport national service organizations. So using those three codes that I showed you earlier here, and with these four policies, I went in and coded all the policies. And unfortunately, this is what I found. I'm, I'm disappointed, but I'm not altogether surprised. As you can see here in this relatively simple table, I found one code and that was the mentor code in the actively engaged a policy on women for a policy on sport for women and girls, sorry. And what I did was, again, I, I really unpacked that policy and saw that the mentor reference was in response to corporate business literature that had been pulled in to say, we need to do this. But there was no explanation for how this might look in the world of sport. So what we can see is that there's a disconnect between policy and research. And this is really important. When we create policy, part of the policy creation process is the research aspect. And it makes sense. You want to know, why would we create a policy on this? We need to know what the issues are. We need to know what's going on. So it's particularly problematic when policy that has a lot of great research isn't talking to each other. Another thing that I wanna demonstrate is that these very distinct outcomes from three separate policies are, are, are troubling because they're relatively ambiguous and unachieved. So for example, women are actively engaged within the Canadian sport, within Canadian sport as coaches, technical leaders and officials. And opportunities are provided for persons from traditionally underrepresented and marginalized populations to actively engage in all aspects of sport participation, including leadership roles. And finally, to monitor the success of these initiatives and initiate improvements if the principles are not achieved. So these are what the policies aim to do. They want to do this. 
But when you read the policies in the context of what's going on, the problem, the literature, the larger political, economic, and social discourses and practices, these outcomes remain, as I said, ambiguous and unachieved. So right now, while we do have programs like mentorship and sponsorship, we don't have programs like mentorship and sponsorship that are backed by policy. And in essence, we're saying that the policy piece doesn't really matter. So in answering the question, how do current national level Canadian sport policies inform and impact mentorship and or sponsorship of women coaches? The answer is a resounding, they do not or they don't. When this happens, we now are in a situation where we're left thinking, whose responsibility is it then to support the advancement of women in sport coaching? Do we emphasize the coaches and their agency? Or do we emphasize the larger structure and the government and their control and their contributing to this problematic situation? I want, to over, I want to emphasize again here the structural aspects and particularly the neoliberalist aspects. So part of neoliberalism is the belief that if you work hard, meritocratic value, that if you work hard, you'll achieve things. And when it's internalized by folks, they again think, well, I just need to go out and work harder. And I need to be a team player, which means that I cannot be critical of what's going on around me. And I need to just go out there and make it happen. So I conclude my article by saying that where sport policies currently exist, we need to make them better. And that where sport policies don't exist on women in sport coaching, particularly U sports and the COC, we need to create them. When we're creating policy or when we're improving policy, we need to go out into the community and talk to the women coaches, talk to the women who have experiences in the context of sport coaching and figure out a way to amplify their voices in the creation of these policies because they are the ones who are being impacted most by the sport policy. Okay, so now I'm gonna take a little bit of time to connect this to the dissertation work. The first slide here, I'm, I'm going to take a bit of time to unpack it and unpack what I mean by a precarious economy of sport coaching. When you look at the data that is available on full time paid university sport pos positions in Canada, there are relatively few positions available. And so here's where I want to bring back in that notion of mentorship. If it is the case that our marker of success is that women will occupy more positions, more full-time paid positions in sport coaching, then we need to consider that the market might not be open to them. In other words, we might be sending women into a market that is either not ready for them or doesn't exist for them. If we know that not a lot of women are occupying those positions and we start to look more at the structural issues for why that exists, then we need to think critically about what we are mentoring or advancing them into. So now I'm going to share a little bit of my never seen before data. So I'm very excited to share this. It's very rough at the moment. And what I've done is I've teased it out into two broader categories. So again, this is the data that I've collected on the gendered and gendering aspects of sport coaching as work. I too want to say that there is a fantastic conversation here about sport, work, and gender and how all three of those intersect. And stay tuned for the research because that's really what my, my work is getting at. And again, I'm, again, just one tangent here is to say that we typically think of, of sport and work as separate. So we typically think of uh, sport to be done in leisure time. And there's some really interesting stuff that happens when we then talk about our sport as our work. So again, that's, that's really what my dissertation is getting at. But again, to bring us back to what I'm sharing about, the gendered and gendered aspects of sport coaching. So the first category are the reinforcers. So these are the people who are reinforcing the gendered and gendering aspects of sport coaching. 
For instance, in this conversation, when I brought up what are the issues that women are facing, this coach told me, well, there, there aren't issues. And when I probed him further on, well, then what do you make of the fact that you've got two female head coaches and I'm leaving out the number of men just to maintain anonymity? His response was that he didn't even know there were two female coaches. So a bit of an interesting dialogue to have. The second conversation was and probably will remain one of the most awkward conversations and uncomfortable conversations that I've ever had. So one of the things that's really difficult for me is that when I'm researching, my coaching self and my researcher self are kind of doing this. And, and to be honest with you, they're sort of doing this all the flipping time. So I always have to sort of deal with that tension. But during this conversation, I so wanted to educate this person. I so wanted to be like, hold on a minute, let me go get my laptop and we can spend the rest of the afternoon talking about this. But again, I, I had to take a step back and go, you're here to do the research and you need to let the data speak for itself. So again, it was just a very uncomfortable conversation. And only at this point in the conversation, I want to say the rest of the conversation was fantastic, but this part of the conversation was very awkward. And lastly, this one was particularly interesting uh, to me because I really appreciated how off the cuff and how like honest this answer was. It was just very genuine and authentic. And I was speaking to a coach who was in a similar age category as me. So I thought he might try to change his answer um, given his audience, but he didn't. He just went forward and, and told me, you know, how his girlfriend, he loves her, but there's no way she could coach. And that there wasn't ever any dialogue. He just knew this about her. So. I kind of, again, had more thoughts in the back of my mind about maybe how this relationship is going, but nonetheless, again, focused on the research. So I'm sharing those three conversations just as ways to show you that gendering and gendered narratives are reinforced in the university sport coaching world. And I also want to mention that, like Michelle Foucault said, power is never total. There's always pockets of resistance that exist. And there are absolutely folks that are working in university sport who are resisting the system. And for instance, I mean, I thought this was brilliant. This was an athletic director. We absolutely have not done enough for women in sports coaching and we need to do more. So what can I do? Well, I cannot say we're not hiring you because you're a man, but I can put on the job posting, we want someone with experience playing women's fill in the blank whatever the sport is. How do we get women to apply? Well, we have to build programs and teach athletes that they can coach. And then when they graduate, we have to go after them. So I thought this was a really wonderful example of how someone was resisting the system. And then finally, this conversation, this was the only female coach I spoke to. And, you know, we were talking about the fact that, no, your gender doesn't impact your ability to do the job. But right now, it's impacting your ability to get the job. And so she had kind of said that they would have to drag her kicking and screaming out of there. So I wanted to, again, add that. I'd like to take this time to acknowledge the folks who are resisting the system. Thank you so much. I'd like to take this time to acknowledge the folks that maybe haven't been resisting the system because they didn't know that these larger things were occurring or that this is maybe the first time it's really been called to your attention. And I also want to acknowledge the people who want to resist, but that aren't in a position to resist because it isn't safe to do so. And to you, I want to encourage you to find people who support you. And I want to offer my support here today to you because I do acknowledge that having these conversations and the resisting the system is difficult, fraught with tension, and met back with a lot of resistance. I would like to end by thanking my supervisor, thanking my mentor coaches, the University of Toronto Women's Volleyball family, which includes an amazing integrated support team, my coaching and academic communities. At some point within these communities, people have said things to me. I've gone home with a piece of paper and just done this to it. So I thank those people. My family who's tuning in today to watch and support. And lastly, my partner who has been studying for the MCAT all week and wrote it this morning, but who took the time to rearrange our apartment for me and also has been listening to do me do this presentation over and over and over again this week.
I would like to suggest some recommended reads to all of you. So there's a wonderful book on feminist scholarship that looks at feminist sports studies, sharing the experiences of joy and pain. There's a wonderful book on policy scholarship, and this is Canadian specific to Canada. And within that book, I wanna highlight the chapter on women in sport policy that is written by my supervisor. And lastly, in the socio-cultural scholarship, uh, Philip White and Kevin Yen's book on sport and gender in Canada, which is sitting right next to me, is also a fantastic read. So for people who want to dive into that, those books and maybe need some further understanding or want to talk about their frustrations, how they felt, what they think about those books, I'm more than happy to chat with you. And I want to just encourage us all to keep the conversation going. And if, if you want to reach out and you want to talk more, you want to provide feedback, you want to ask some questions, I'm always happy to chat with you. So thank you everyone today for your attention. I truly appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much, Alex. Um, we have some questions here. Um, I'm just going to, I want to state my feelings. I, reading those coach statements, like part of me was just on fire, um, angry. And so good for you for, um, uh, I would just say, uh, how do I would say this? Um, for staying neutral in those situations, because I don't think I would have been able to stay neutral and focus on the research. So good for you on that. Um, we got all sorts of questions. So I'm going to see what I can work through. Um, I'm just going to highlight, I love that you brought up the fact that not everybody is in a position to resist. And I think that's such an important thing to recognize is not everybody has that privilege, um, which kind of brings me to one of the questions that's come in. And that is whether there's some research around how this expectation of women to engage in kind of this informal mentorship actually can expose them into positions where there's power positions where there's potential for abuse. Is there anything yeah. that's come up in that? Yeah. Um, so great question, whoever has posed it. I think it's super critical and important to consider. Like I said, I, for, you know, the p purpose of this research, I didn't so much go into the, like, how have coaching mentorship programs been evaluated? But when you're speaking about informal mentorship, there's always the risk that this can happen. So I don't know if I'm interpreting the question accurately. So I apologize if I'm not, but Absolutely, it's the case that if you get pulled into an informal mentorship um, situation and you're sitting there going, well, this is a coach who has credentials, who has accolades, who has the, all this experience, I'm supposed to learn from this person. Um, what I would say is if it's not a fit for you, go and try to find other people. I'm not saying that's easy to do, but also just in general, find other people and talk to them about their experiences, especially in the informal mentorship stuff, because that is the more off the cuff stuff that happens here or there, right? Of course, in any situation, if you feel like you are being abused, um, you know, you, you do need to find someone to chat that through with. Um, I would advocate for you to find someone that you can reach out to that's safe to mention that to. Um, again, acknowledging it's not always easy for us to mention the abuse we've experienced. We don't always feel safe to do that. But if you do have people you can reach out to, reach out to those people. Um, in general, when that happens too, I would say just to, to get some clarity on like, whoa, okay, like what happen there and and not to question how you felt because that's not what's important how you felt is real and valid it's just to go okay like did i like was that you know just just to go again is this is this person speaking for all the people or is this a one-off situation where that that might have happened so i don't know if that really answers the question but i just want to say definitely protect yourself and definitely when you can be be very picky and choosy of who those those mentors are who those informal mentors are uh, one final thing i want to say too is that <laughs> i didn't say this but like as much as we learn from these mentors about what we want to do, we also learn what we don't want to do. And so if it is the case that this person is doing stuff that you don't agree with, I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying don't dismiss how you're feeling, but like, 
you know, realize that like, okay, I never want to be like that. That is not what, that's not me. That doesn't suit me. That doesn't work for me. Right. So, I mean, I know I started with this very glamorous idea of what informal mentorship can look like because I stumbled, well, I didn't stumble upon Christine. Christine was a really good friend of Diane Scott who coached me. Um, we, but, but I had no idea that, that we were gonna like, like it was just gonna be like magic. That's how I just describe it, right? So, so definitely be picky about who is, who is mentoring you and who you're, you're listening to. I, I hope that answered the question. I think it did, I, but I think um, I think it kind of comes back to that idea that we need better structure within our mentorship. So we are protecting, you know, people as they're get, engaging them, and it also comes back to that kind of expectation that females are the one kind of leading that, right? That we're we're forced to engage in these, and maybe sometimes we're forced to put ourselves in unsafe spaces. Totally, and it speaks to that relationship piece. Like, like, what is a meaningful relationship? What is a mentoring relationship? I'm sorry, I don't care how many manuals you read. If you're not a person-centered person and you don't value relationships, how are you going to create a meaningful one? Right? Like, that's that's the aspect that's like that's so critical. That's so important. That's why I love working with Christine because we have a great relationship. So, how do you create that? I mean. I, I wish I had the, the perfect resume, um, um, recipe for you, but it starts with listening to people, actually listening, you know? So anyway, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you for that. Um, one kind of question. So we, you've talked about representation of females, but I'm wondering if you know anything about the representation of people of different gender identities or sexual identities and how that's showing up in coaching roles. Yeah, so again, I really wish that we could collect data on that. But the reason, again, that we, I think one of the bigger reasons is that, again, it's been unsafe to do so. Women who identify and disclose that they might be queer or they might not be female cisgender or they might be bisexual or homosexual, it hasn't been a safe space for them to, to talk about that because they've either faced discrimination in their workplaces or they've read stories of women who've been tossed out and it's just so how can you expect these women to come forward and share their experiences and, and in saying that there are women who have come forward there are trailblazers there are women who have said yeah this happened and i'm going to use the experience of betty baxter here she's the only woman who ever coached our national women's volleyball program back in the 60s and she was fired for suspicions of being homosexual. Well, she later came out in CBC and said, I am, and this is why I was fired. And she called into question those people. She called into question the, how they were discriminating against her and her sexuality. So I think a lot of, there isn't, a, there isn't research on that. And I think because a lot of people are like, well, why would I admit to that? I'm trying to get a job. My, my gender alone is working against me why would I then come forward and, and disclose to people, right? And it hasn't always been safe to do so. so. So that's what I would offer there. And again, I would say that I am not aware of, of, of literature. I, I know Guylaine Demars has done some really great literature out of, um, out of Laval, Université Laval. So she's got some stuff there, but I think most of that is relation to athletes. I don't know if it's actually coaches. I'm gonna follow up on that. Yeah, and I, I think that brings up such an important point, the fact that it is unsafe and it really, it highlights the fact that as women, we're still, in order to succeed in these roles, we're trying to fit into this little box that says, yeah, you're acceptable, right? Yeah. And that it is still so narrow. Absolutely. Um, you touched on the need for policy change, which I think you made very obvious. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit maybe about some other policy teams. For example, as Vicky um, brought up this morning, the fact that um, things like mat leave and other health related things are not necessarily supportive for females. So there may be there's this barrier for women in that sense. 
Absolutely. So one of the questions I actually asked people in the interviews was like, what are your policies on equity and inclusion? And, and also like, what are your MAP policies? Do you have MAP policies? And a lot, of, there was a resounding like, well, we don't have that. Now in the integrated sport universities, so when I say integrated, I mean where athletics and academics are together under the same faculty, um, th that athletic director shared with me that they, that those coaches are then grouped under the faculty um, membership. And so they get that policy, that mat leave policy applies to them. So that's a very secure situation. There's only three institutions in Canada that have that. And even within those three institutions, not everyone has the same faculty designation. So it is a hodgepodge. The other non-integrated university I looked at, they didn't have a maternity leave policy. There isn't one. And so it, you, you kind of, again, when you're a person who's thinking about coaching and having a family and, and coaches in the interviews were bringing up, well, I guess the reason women don't coach is because they need to have kids. And I'm sitting there going, can we not do both? Yeah. And, and so here's the other thing that I, I just want to quickly share an anecdote here. And I'm not going to say this person's name because I didn't ask for permission before to do so. But one of my colleagues that also coaches in the OUA who just had a baby was, was telling me that folks were coming at her and being like, well, like great timing on having your kid during uh, nationals during the final weeks. And it's like, are you kidding me? Like this expectation that we're supposed to have our babies in around our season. First and foremost, fertility doesn't work like that. It's not man and woman equals baby. There's a whole host of biochemical processes that have to go on for a baby to be created. So again, the, the maternity leave policy is extremely underdeveloped. Um, there are programs in Canada that do have great maternity leave policies. I know at U of T, if I was to get pregnant, Christine has told me there would be support for me. But I know what the two universities I coached at before this, there, there were no policies. So we've got this haphazard, we've got this hodgepodge patchwork of programs and policies that exist in Canada. <sighs> I was going to say, I think I know one of those universities, I won't name it, but I will say that coaches are unionized and it's interesting within that because with that also came a pay cut. So it was like, you get one or the other, right? Like it's not, you're not getting both. And it, again, we're just not fully supported, right? Like, oh, no. So again, the overwhelming message and, and that's why you can't blame people for having some of the beliefs they do because they go, well, I just don't see women having babies in coaching. I don't see it. So for me, it just doesn't exist. Right. <laughs> so anyway, I will, I will say one of my first ever coaching um, interviews, I was asked if there was danger of me getting pregnant mid season. So it's real. <laughs> it's not and not their business and again i'm going to share one more anecdote here another friend of mine coaching in university sport on the recruitment trip i i've heard this through the grapevine a mom asked so when are you going to have babies and abandon the team <sighs> whoa yeah whoa whoa that is so loaded. There are so many things to unpack there, but, but sorry, I digress. Yeah. Here I go on my tangents. I'm yeah. given an opportunity and I just, I can't help myself. <laughs> and I, I'm sure we could have a very heated conversation about all of that. Um, I'm mindful of time, but I have one question and I, one final question I kind of want to wrap up with. And that is like, what do you see as next steps for changing these policies? Like what do, what do we need to be doing to get these changes? Yeah, I mean, that's a really great question, Amy. Thank you so much for asking it. I, my brain goes in so many different directions. Uh, first and foremost, these policies, especially the actively engaged one, it has an accountability framework built into it. And so it does have this, like, here's how we evaluate policy on an ongoing basis. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that when we do create policies, we do explicitly state how we're going to evaluate and follow up on them. So some of these policies that I included in this presentation are, are really outdated, 2009, 2010, 2005. It's time to update your policies. And again, I, I want to urge the folks who are working in these sport organizations to find policy study people, to find people like me, like, 
you know, I, I would be happy to share my knowledge and my literature if it meant that we would be pushing the needle forward, right? And even as I say that statement, I know it's problematic because we depend on women and their volunteered work to advance it. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a passionate volunteer that wants to lead change. That is fantastic. We need to start putting some money to this people. We have lives too. And this is really, really important. So again, I think those policymakers need to engage researchers. They need to engage the coaches. Go and talk to the women coaches who are coaching in your organization. If you're a national body, find somebody who knows a woman coach and go and talk to them. Right. And, and even I said that might be a problem because maybe you don't have any women coaching in your sport. I just believe that people need to do a little bit more work. You might need to dig a little deeper because we're not so common. You might need to go out and actually find us. But I can say that I know most women want to see change happen. And a lot of women in higher performance sport want to see that change happen. And if given the opportunity to engage, they would do so. But I, I just want to advocate for myself here. I'd love to do that kind of work. Hire me. I'll go. I'll do the research. I'll talk to the people. I'll come back. I'll, you know, I'll do my thing. But yeah, I think that would be one of the ways, you know, engage the larger population and, and recognize that you know, I think a lot of folks in sport organization and sport admins think they have to write policy. They think it's under their job description, and maybe it is, but if it's not your area of expertise, we have people getting degrees in policy writing, right? You know, maybe go outside and, and try to find some of those people. So that would, that would be what I would say. <laughs> I appreciate your passion and I really hope someone does take you up on that offer because it is so, it's so important, right? And so often we think we can do things without, you know, getting the people that are experts in it, right? Like, but let's get the experts and have them do it, right? So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your work. I am so excited to read your dissertation when it's done. I want to know all about it. So, and I need everyone to send positive vibes to Alex as she's writing because um, it's a tough process. So good luck with that. Um, good luck with all of this. And thank you so much for all of this. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone on the call. Reminder, tomorrow, two more talks. Uh, Chris is going to talk about transition, which is going to be fantastic. Such an important part of our athlete career that we don't talk about enough. And Liz is going to talk about body image, which is so, so important in female sport and just in female life. So I hope you all join us. Thank you again, Alex. And thank you to everybody.